Rules Committee to come to order, and thank you very much. I uh, want to welcome each of you back, uh, not only to the Rules Committee, but to an opportunity for us all to learn about what will be in this new uh, offering that we will have uh, to amend what we're doing to further um, fund the government. And today the committee will be considering the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1892, the extension of continuing appropriations for 2018. This legislation will extend government funding through March the 23rd, 2018, while simultaneously funding the Department of Defense for one year. This will ensure our nation's defense and pay our proud servicemen and women, and they will no longer be in jeopardy of ongoing discussions on funding and the Secretary of Defense is allowed to move forth to not only prepare himself and the military to protect this great nation, but to give them the assets and resources necessary to make the uh, decisions that come with that. So you and I are both aware that uh, there are issues going on that are long-term spending cap deals, and uh, we will get to those issues also. I think everybody can agree that every month our military operates under continuing resolution. We are continuing to see the demise not only of our military and causing increasing anxiety to them, but also giving our adversaries another reason to know that this country is going through a difficult time. This legislation provides more time to reach a long-term deal in spending levels while immediately providing our military with the resources they need especially at this difficult time. In addition to funding the government, this legislation extends funding for community health centers for two years through the Community Health Center Fund. These critical health centers employ 190,000 people and serve over 24 million patients. One in 13 people nationwide rely on health centers for their health care needs, and it's incumbent we come together to support this bill to ensure that it is funded properly. Bill also includes a number of important Medicare extenders and public health priorities, many of which have passed out of the committee uh, over on the, on the House side on a bipartisan basis, and I believe they have wide set support in the Senate. These common sense improvements, such as the therapy cap extension and full funding to expand access to in-home treatments for Medicare patients are vital to our constituents, seniors and others of those with disabilities. I just was in the back office receiving a uh, detailed review of what is in the bill from, from a number of perspectives. And I think I come prepared to personally not only be prepared to answer questions, but to understand what I would be expected to support in this bill. I'd personally like to thank Chairman Kevin Brady, Chairman Brady from Woodford, from the uh, Woodlands in Texas, uh, works as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and he's had to address a number of the issues that were brought to his plate because I brought them on home infusion, which was an example of a cost-saving measure that was attempted over a year ago. The chairman most adequately has not only responded, met with people, and seen that he needed to readdress the issue. Chairman Brady did, and I want to publicly thank Chairman Brady for his work. Also, the gentleman, uh, Greg Walden, from the Energy and Commerce Committee for becoming engaged in this issue. Many members, not just myself, Chairman Barton in particular, I know, has stayed after many of these issues and on a bipartisan basis. I hope that they were addressed. I'd like to welcome the gentlewoman from Fort Worth, Texas, Kay Granger, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Viskoski, the gentleman, Mr. Roskin, the gentleman, Mr. Levin, uh, and the gentleman, Mr. Barton, who I believe is sitting in for the chairman of the committee uh, as the uh, senior emeritus member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Chairman uh, Barton comes to us uh, not only out of a long-term uh, opportunity for him to understand the difficulties that we're facing, but the importance of why we're here today, and I want to thank Chairman Barton for doing that. We're delighted to have you on the Rules Committee, and I will tell you, you know the rules around here, but uh, without objection, anything you brought in writing will enable us to fully complete the transcript with our awesome stenographer. And before we uh, come directly to uh, Mrs. Granger to speak about this, I'm going to yield to the gentlewoman from New York for any opening comments she'd like to make. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I 
<laughs> I've been here a long time, and I've got genuine love and respect for my Republican colleagues. But I think the United States of America is really getting close to some tipping point here. And we can't pussyfoot around, as we say in Kentucky, on, on what we think has to be done. You know that one too, Joe, right? I've heard it. <laughs> you know, I think this proposal this afternoon is absolute proof that the majority is unable to govern. This is the fifth continuing resolution since the fiscal year began nearly five months ago. That means every single month we've done another continuing resolution. Not only can the military not do that, none of the federal agencies can plan, produce, do anything in the world except wonder where in the world they are. Now, this resolution was brought out from the back room late last night, and once again, the Democrat Party has no fingerprints on it. It doesn't include action on many of the priorities that all of us agree need to be addressed. And that includes things like providing additional disaster relief, saving Americans' uh, endangered pensions, and extending additional health access for our veterans. The bill pays for extending the community health care centers, which I know the chair and I have talked about for months here since September, uh, by eviscerating the Affordable Care Act's prevention fund. Now, I don't think it makes sense to anybody that you're going to try to treat people, but you're not going to vaccinate them and do the other things to prevent them from getting sick. This is being done by the majority during the worst flu epidemic in nearly a decade. The uh, numbers I got last week is 34 children have already died. The proposal also does not raise the Budget Controls Act sequester level spending caps for non-defense. It's irresponsible to claim to care about national defense while refusing to equally raise both the defense and non-defense caps. And I know that there's no better expert on that than my friend Biskoski. The Congress finds itself here again because the majority prioritized tax cuts for the wealthy instead of fulfilling its most basic responsibilities of funding the government. The Trump administration is on track to borrow nearly $1 trillion this year because of the tax bill. That is the highest amount of borrowing in six years and nearly doubled what we borrowed in the 2017 fiscal year. Only during the Second World War was our debt as a percentage of GDP, gross domestic product, higher than it is right now. We're being led by a man who has called himself the king of debt, and he also has not paid his debts. USA Today has reported that more than 200 liens were filed against President Trump or his businesses by contractors and employees going back to the 1980s. The claimants include everyone from curtain makers to his own lawyers. And he's also handled that debt by declaring bankruptcy multiple times. Now, the United States has never defaulted on its debt, ever. But I'm afraid the king of debt might be planning to do just that. Perhaps he thinks that the United States won't pay its bills. Mm -hmm. We are seeing with the stock market in the last three days that the United States is being defined by chaos. The majority is allowing to happen with short-term proposals like this that leave the whole world to wonder whether the biggest superpower in the world will be able to keep the lights on. I regretfully yield back. I'm, I'm, I'm very angry about this uh, because I see no plan. I see nothing coming up. I, I see no even nothing uh, except calling my side of the house treasonous because we didn't applaud at a public function. These are the kinds of things that I am alluding to that make us look more and more like a banana republic. I ask unanimous consent to put in the record an article from today's Washington Post called the U.S. government is set to borrow nearly one trillion this year, an 84% jump from last year. And you know that we are also going to be asked to do uh, a, a trillion more for infrastructure. Now, I'm not sure who's going to fund that for us, but we live in a country now where we had three train wrecks with fatalities in three weeks. We understand infrastructure is crumbling 
90% of our bridges are faulty or dangerous. And yet, we did that gigantic tax cut for which a secretary was able to get in her paycheck $1.50 more a week, while the Koch brothers got billions. So I yield back the balance of my John time. John yields back the time. Thank you very much. The, um, this is the bill. It was not just done last night. It's uh, taken some period of time. It's been through most of it regular order, many votes, many opportunities that we've done here on the House. Uh, there were some new provisions. There were some new things that were added. Uh, but I think the biggest point that I would make about my balancing this out, uh, Joe, do you want to join us? All right. Uh, we play football together, so the gentleman's going to play tight end today. You'll be at that end. You'll be the last one on. Well, I didn't wasn't referring to that. All I'm saying is you'll be the last one to speak too, so you're doing just fine. Make yourself at home. Um, I think what's in here, nobody would disagree with. It's not the final deal. But I'm proud of what, what is in here. And just like last time when we did CHIP, we authorized CHIP for six years. Uh, it was the right thing to do, and so I think great things are there. So now I consider this an appropriations bill, and I consider that you've got expert witnesses, Ms. Granger, that are here with you not only from both committees, uh, but, but also, uh, Joe, who do you represent? Energy and Commerce Committee. So you'll, you'll be with, give testimony there with, with Chairman Barton. Ms. Granger, I'm going to come to you first uh, as the uh, senior appropriator in the room, and the gentlewoman's recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to testify uh, before you once again on the urgency of enacting a fiscal year 2018 defense appropriations bill. I appreciate every opportunity to discuss this bill as its enactment is vital to our national security. This morning, while testifying at the House Armed Services Committee, Secretary of Defense Mattis called a frequent continuing resolutions an abrogation of congressional constitutional duty and again warned that budget uncertainty harms the, the military. He said that he could not overstate the impact to our troops' morale from all this uncertainty. Secretary Mattis said that operating the Department of Defense under continuing resolutions means the Pentagon would not be able to pay troops by the end of the fiscal year, would not be able to recruit Army soldiers and Air Force airmen to fill shortfalls, would not be able to maintain ships at sea, would need to ground aircraft due to a lack of maintenance and spare parts, and would curtail training and delay contracts for acquisition programs. The bill before you today prevents all of this by including the full year appropriation for the Department of Defense, which has already passed the House three times. The bill provides $659 billion for defense and is $28 billion above the President's request and more than $60 billion above last year's levels. When combined with the almost, 50, almost $5 billion enacted into law in December, this bill matches the top-line funding level of the enacted National Defense Authorization Act. All federal dollars are not the same. We must prioritize national security funding. The world is increasingly dangerous, and after years of neglecting our national security, we must enact a full-year defense bill now. We're almost four months into fiscal year 2018, and our troops still don't have their funding. Our troops and our national security should not be used as leverage for unrelated issues. It's time to lift the budget caps and enact a full-year Defense Appropriation Act so that our military can begin to rebuild. The bill takes care of our troops by providing additional manpower and fully funding a 2.4 percent pay increase. It provides additional funding for key readiness programs and robustly funds maintenance of equipment and facilities. It makes critical investments in key areas to ensure that we maintain our air, ground, and naval superiority now and in the future. The bill recognizes what our military leaders have told us over and over again. They need sufficient, sustainable, and stable funding, and they need it now. 
The House has done its job more than once to fund our troops at the levels they need, only to have the Senate fail to act. I thank the Chairman and Rules Committee members for giving me the opportunity to testify today and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Chairwoman Granger, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Veslowski, we're delighted that you're here. She's going to share that microphone. I appreciate you taking time to, for you to be here, Pete, and I want to reinforce what Mrs. Slaughter has said. Your in-depth, deep knowledge is important to this committee, and we've counted on you for wise, sage advice for a number of years, and we're delighted that you're here. Jones recognized. Chairman, I appreciate your kind words. I would simply say to all of the members, I am appalled to be here and taking up your time for the fifth continuing resolution, 129 days into this fiscal year, and to join uh, my chair, who has done a superlative job on the Defense Appropriations Bill for the fourth time for the same essential bill that this Congress has passed on three separate occasions. And we have nothing further to ask because we have discussed this three separate times. Thank you very much. Um, before I get to Mr. Kennedy, I'm going to advise all the members that I have not heard otherwise, but when you come give testimony here, you stay till the bloody end. <laughs> so you can't, you can't come tell us whatever you want to tell us and then get up and leave. So I'll just remind you, uh, that's the rules of the House, and I'm the chairman. So that's where we are. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're delighted that you're here. I want you to know that the gentleman, uh, the gentleman from the Ways and Means Committee wanted you to go next. So the gentleman from Ennis, Texas, is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will have to inform you as chairman. Uh, at 2.30, uh, Mr. Kennedy and I are supposed to be in the Energy and Commerce Committee for the official photograph of the committee. Well, that's a good enough reason. I just didn't know it. So I hope that you'll excuse so that us two <laughs> at about 2.25. That would be great. Uh, so it is now 1.20. So thank, you, thank you for the notice. The gentleman's request will be granted. I want to. Be be, beg your pardon? <laughs> I hope so. Um, normally, I would say I'd be the briefest um, testifier, but I think Mr. Viskoski has got us all beat. He did. He won. Admirable. Uh, as the uh, Vice Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, I'm happy to represent the majority of that committee uh, here at Rules today. Uh, Energy and Commerce has a number of um, provisions in the continuing resolution. It has a two-year extension of community health centers, a two-year extension of funding for the public health programs. Uh, it cancels uh, cuts in current law to the Medicaid uh, safety net hospitals, uh, these are called disproportionate share hospitals. It cancels those cuts. Uh, it also uh, permanently repeals the Medicare cap, payment cap for therapy services. Uh, it uh, has a permanent repeal of the rental cap for durable medical equipment with respect to uh, speech genera generating devices. And it permanently extends special needs plans in Medicare Advantage so that millions of dual eligibles can continue to benefit, benefit from integrated care. It has a number of bipartisan Medicare policies, uh, the Chronic Care Act, the Part B Improvement Act, among those uh, that have passed the committee of, uh, that I and Mr. Kennedy are on with a bipartisan support. Um, so with that, I'll yield back. I do want to say that as a member of the majority, I am hopeful that we can eventually very quickly get to a, a bill that funds the government for the rest of this year. I, I don't have a major heartburn with the minority's comment that uh, funding the bill, funding the government on continuing resolutions is not the way to go. Uh, it would be nice, Mr. Chairman, at some point in time if we address that in a bipartisan basis. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Minnesota, Texas, the gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, Joe, we're delighted that you're here. I hope your dad's watching you today. I'm going to call him and tell him how you did, so good luck. Chairman, thank you. Um, why don't I start by deferring back to our more senior members if they haven't spoken yet. I, I am happy to embrace. Jones that. recognized. Well, I'd appreciate you taking time because when you finish, we're going to come after you. <laughs> we never yield the ways and means. 
at which point I, uh, I will make sure if you're coming after me to speak for a very yes, long sir. time. Thank yes, you. Um, so uh, let me start, Mr. Chairman, by uh, joining the comments of uh, my other colleagues here and saying that it is um, with a heavy heart that we are here today to have to go through this process yet again. I think uh, all members of Congress would welcome the opportunity to uh, provide clarity and certainty to uh, our government, to our citizens, to make sure that um, we don't have to continue to uh, engage in these in government by crisis, if you will. Uh, critically important, as both uh, Ms. Granger and Mr. Vaklosky uh, talked about, the, the impact for our men and women in uniform and the, and the people they serve. Also critically important for a whole wide variety of other programs that are uh, go to the, the health, the well-being, the safety, and prosperity of our nation. Um, and while uh, there are important programs that have been uh, reauthorized uh, or will be reauthorized uh, with this program. There's a number of programs that uh, that have been left out, um, and I feel it is important for uh, the record for us to point out the fact that um, this bill does not um, make the necessary uh, um, additions to um, increase access to health care for our veterans. It does not go nearly as far as we need um, to uh, increase funding for to combat an opioid epidemic um, and. Uh, does not go nearly as far as we need in order to uh, secure pensions of hardworking families across our nation. Um, there are a number of important health programs that are not included. Um, one, for instance, the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, which is a voluntary uh, home visiting program that for at-risk uh, pregnant women and their families to improve maternal and child health. The funding for the Health Professional Opportunity Grant Programs, um, and as I mentioned, ongoing funding for an opioid crisis. Uh, I think every single member of Congress is aware uh, this is an epidemic that stretches across our nation uh, in um, Democratic communities and Republican ones. Um, and we've seen a, uh, the number of deaths jumping from uh, opioid abuse increase by 20% in 2016. This is a, uh, something that the President has called a national emergency. Uh, we have not appropriated the necessary funding that is uh, required that I think our communities expect um, in order to combat this. This is something many folks on this committee and around the country see every day. Um, we, need, uh, we need to get there. Um, I, I have been um, saddened to see that um, some of the cuts put forth um, in this program um, include $10 billion in Medicaid, um, including some cuts to safety net hospitals and removing an offset um, for additional cuts in 2018 and 2019. Um, it also is um, disheartening to see, yet again, another attack on the ACA Prevention Fund, um, $2.85 billion. Um, that attacks one of the premier funds for health care investment across our country, which I think anybody that follows this debate knows one of the, while there is a, a disagreement on, um, on the role of the federal government in health care, no one, I don't think, uh, has an abiding desire to try to uh, not to find ways to increase uh, our delivery reforms and make those more uh, economically efficient without compromising quality. Cuts to programs like uh, the chronic disease self-management program, the diabetes prevention program, uh, uh, heart disease stroke prevention, um, I think are, are penny wise and pound foolish. Um, trying to cut off the, early, the earlier interventions that many of these recipients need to stay healthy uh, and, and out of the hospital, out of clinical or critical care programs, um, aren't going to lead us to, to the place we need to go to get the overall costs of, of health care under control. Um, so I would, uh, I would love to, to join my colleagues and get to a point where we are able to get to a broad bipartisan deal. Um, I hope we can do that expeditiously, and I, I would urge consideration for um, bringing the Congress together on a program that um, incorporates uh, some of the, the priorities for Democrats as well as Republicans, and unfortunately, I'm not so sure we're there yet. Yield back. Gentlemen, yields back to them. Thank you very much. The, uh, the uh, gentleman, Mr. Roskam. Mr. Roskam, thank you so much for coming back. We're delighted that you're here and gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman yes, and sir. Ranking Member Slaughter. Um, you know, as the four previous members have articulated, nobody's celebrating this today, but I think there's a recognition that we need to do what we need to do. Uh, to create an environment where we move forward. And I want to highlight uh, some of the portions in Subtitle F, which are in the Ways and Means Committee's jurisdiction. Um, included in the policies are a number of things that a majority has agreed on, policies like averting a hard cap on therapy services for many vulnerable beneficiaries in Medicare. I know I've heard from my constituents, some of whom are being told they're going to pay out of pocket for stroke coverage. This is simply unsustainable, and I know that there's not a member here that doesn't care desperately. 
about those um, constituents. We need to deal with that cap. Or our community health centers and rural hospitals who are served, serving many low-income constituents, but they can't do it simply if they're not being compensated. The subtitle also includes many common sense policies that have made it through regular order, a majority of passed at least one chamber policies like the ambulance extender introduced by Mr. Nunez and Ms. Sewell, and special needs plans introduced by Mr. Tiberi and my friend Mr. Levin. Policies that encourage greater access for patients who want to receive their um, care in homes are under consideration or expand our ability to reach rural constituents through telehealth services or modernizations in policy for alternative payment models within Medicare that increase managed care as well as providers willingly taking on more risk to provide quality. In addition to these extender policies, this title includes much needed structural reforms in the Medicare program. Ms. Nome introduced the title which includes a restructuring of the home health payment system. The title also includes policies that give providers some desperately needed regulatory relief as introduced by Mr. Blumenauer and Mr. Marchant will provide relief to home health agencies. Mr. Chairman, I've got to, I, I need to stress that this is largely a bipartisan package, particularly in this title, subtitle F. And it's a package where policy changes and improvements that will impact these industries have impacted uh, by the extender policies that both benefit the providers and their patients. There's finally a technical amendment that I want to bring to your attention for uh, which conforms to correct dates for studies as well as making market basket adjustments. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Ross. Mr. Levin, we're delighted that you're with us. The gentleman's recognized. Well, I say with a smile, I'm glad to be here again. I've been here often. You know, there are some bipartisan pieces here. The problem is that the basic bill is not at all partisan. And there's criticism of the Senate, and we pass bills and they don't pass them. It's often because the bills we put out of here are so partisan that they can't pass the Senate. <coughs> and that's true of this bill. I don't think it will pass the Senate. I think it has the objective, I think that's quite clear, of putting some Democrats on the spot voting against it because of the defense position. And I think that's very regretful. Mr. Chairman and to my colleagues on the Republican side, why wasn't there a moment taken by the majority here to sit down with the minority to discuss what would be in this CR? Why not? Um, and it's regretful. I, I agree there are some bipartisan provisions that soon came through our committee. There are provisions that are not included that might have been, and Joe Kennedy has mentioned several of them, the maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting bill, funding for the health professional opportunity grant, and funding on the opioid crisis. It's unspeakable. I just looked at the data for Michigan. I can't believe the number of deaths. And the president said it was going to be a top priority. And there isn't funding here. So I ask that my statement be included in the record, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to emphasize from my, all of my years here, it is inexcusable that this bill is coming up, what is it, the fifth CR? Without any effort by the leadership on the majority side to sit down and discuss with us what should be in it in terms of the basic parts of the CR. We need to address the domestic part of this. The domestic programs are going to receive a smaller portion of GNP than in, true in decades. And so you pass a bill that doesn't refer to any of them. 
And I think you're increasing the depth of partisanship here. And the country is paying an immense pride, a pr price for it. Immense, Mr. Chairman, and to all of you. And you keep saying next time. How many times have you said next time? You bet. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I'd like to say this time, but I'm going to defer uh, my time to the gentleman from Louisville, Texas, Dr. Michael Burgess. <coughs> Dr. Burgess, as you know, with these two members, have to go to uh, an Energy and Commerce uh, Committee meeting, and I would like for the committee to recognize that we should at least uh, direct those questions to them first and move as quickly as we can, knowing that they'll be out 2 30 gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Of course, my priority is always the Rules Committee, as you know. Uh, so I will be. The <laughs> I will be staying with you till, till our work is done. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Levin, I have a solution for your problem, and it's to end the 60-vote rule in the Senate to pass an appropriations bill, but that doesn't seem to be within my power. If it were, I would do so in a heartbeat so we wouldn't have these continued conundrums that we find ourselves in. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, the Vice Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Barton, detailed the uh, provisions, the public health, <coughs> Public health provisions that are within the uh, within the bill. Uh, the, the House passed many of these provisions last November, when we passed the Championing Healthy Kids Act. Since the House passage, the legislation has been stalled without action in the Senate. While the Children's Health Insurance Program was thankfully reauthorized in the last the last continuing resolution, we didn't complete the public health or Medicare extenders. The continuing resolution that we are debating today includes funding for other important public health programs such as community health centers, the National Health Service Corps, uh, teaching health centers, and uh, as Mr. Barton pointed out, the two-year extension on the uh, disproportionate share hospitals so that uh, those cuts would be delayed those cuts that went in October 1st will be delayed for an additional two years. So it's uh, all of these provisions have come through our com subcommittee and our committee. They have all received hearings and markups and were ready for action last year, last fall. Um, for whatever reason, after the House passed them, the Senate decided not to I refer you back to my comments on eliminating the 60-vote rule, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back time. Thank you very much. The uh, gentleman from Oklahoma, uh, Mr. Chairman, we want to once again express our support of you and your team in this difficult time, and we acknowledge yesterday the hurt that we knew that you felt and the desire from all members of the committee to say we stand behind you and we welcome you. The gentleman's recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I was actually going to open. I just wanted to thank you personally and thank everybody uh, on this committee and staff. Uh, I've had so many uh, wonderful people reach out to us on uh, both sides of the aisle and uh, offer their condolences for the untimely loss of my chief of staff and uh, my very, very good friend. And I just want to uh, know how much we appreciate it. We've communicated that to his family. They appreciate it very, very much, and uh, uh, things like this remind us that uh, we may have our differences, but uh, we have a lot more things in common, and moments like this, uh, certainly uh, you don't wish for anybody, but you do see the best of people in them. And again, I want to sincerely thank all of you, including any of our friends right here uh, at, the, at the podium, and my good friend, the chairman, is kind enough to mention this to me this morning in our hearing. So just thank all of you very much. and. Uh, Please keep uh, Sean and his wife, Joanna, and their three children in your prayers, one thing I'd ask. Um, I'm not going to ask a lot of questions here because my good friend, the uh, ranking member of Defense Probst, pointed out we've heard this a lot, and uh, we're pretty familiar with it. I've had the privilege of going through it, and most of the other things here are pretty bipartisan. Um, and look, I know there are things where we differ, and some of those things have been listed in detail, but the, the overwhelming majority of this package is something that we all agree on. Uh, and uh, uh, even if you didn't agree with every component part, I think it'd be hard to look at it and not agree with 90% of it. I mean, in a bill this size, that's usually enough to, to go forward, and I suspect the House will, and it'll move it across the floor again, uh, and also move these other really important items. I particularly want to thank my friend from Illinois on the uh, uh, 
uh, and my friend from the Energy and Commerce Committee on on the community health centers. That's an important component and uh, getting some certainty there. All of us have lots of constituents that are dealt with it. I, I, I would like to get the special diabetes program, particularly the one for Native Americans. I know you guys will do it because I've talked to the chairman. And so, But I would just ask us and our colleagues uh, on the other side of the rotunda, uh, because I think this is meant to try and force a decision. Uh, and at least when I originally got here, we were not in a situation where we had to agree on everything before we agreed on anything. And when we have something that we agreed on, we could move that and continue to work on the other things. We agree on defense. We've passed the defense uh, authorization bill with overwhelming bipartisan support. Uh, we know these funding levels draw broad support on the other side of the, uh, of the aisle from us, and, uh, and uh, they're just as dedicated to defending the United States of America as, as we are in the majority. They certainly are in the minority. So I would just, uh, add, you know, again, legislation's a process. I think this is the right thing to do. Maybe we'll get something back different. <coughs> from the United States Senate, but give us back something we can work on. Give us some agreed upon caps, give us some things in negotiation. Uh, because again, this House has repeatedly sent over the defense bill and with bipartisan support on the authorization and quite often bipartisan vote on the appropriation as well. Uh, and let's just stop trying to hold one another ransom and just sort of move things when we agree. Uh, and uh, we certainly agree on, on community uh, you know, health centers. And um, uh, while my friends have some concerns about funding sources, I recognize that as legitimate or not having more money in this program. Uh, although when you ask for more money and complain about the deficit simultaneously, it sort of creates an interesting discussion point. But uh, I just, I think we should move this. I think we will move it. And then I just hope our friends in the Senate will talk to one another and, and send us back something that we can work with. Uh, and uh, I, I happen to believe in this uh, time period we could resolve all these issues, certainly the appropriations issues in front of us. And I think one big breakthrough in, in defense is it, surely, uh, would help. Uh, and again, they don't have to send us back exactly what they sent, what we sent them, but let's just start the process of going to conference and actually negotiating a final bill. And I, I hope we achieve that here today. And uh, with that, I know we're under time constraints, uh, Mr. Chairman. So. I'll yield back, but I want to thank all my friends uh, for being here. I know how hard they've worked on all these different components. They're largely things I can agree with and, honestly, things I can be enthusiastic about from all three of these committees and particularly from uh, my friends, uh, the chairman, the ranking member of the Defense Appropriations Committee, where I'm, I'm uh, privileged to sit. I just want to thank both of you. You guys have just worked tirelessly putting the defense of the country. I certainly yield to my friend, the ranking member. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, but in response to uh, your comments, Mr. Cole, uh, and uh, Dr. Burgess's uh, comments about 60 votes in the Senate, the chairwoman, and you sit on the subcommittee, we have at least one other appropriator in the room, the process we've gone through, and people have talked about a bipartisan group, could not have been more transparent, more collegial, uh, more bipartisan, more serious. Uh, and I think that also is reflective on the other 11 subcommittees. We can sit here maybe for the fifth time next month with a sixth CR complaining about, and, and I don't disagree with the doctor on 60 votes or somebody has to talk to each other. We are operating under the Budget Control Act that I did not vote for, but I will play by whatever rules you give me. Congress has voted for a two-year deal in the past to set aside that act. Subsequently, a different Congress voted to set aside that act for two years. Two weeks ago, when the chairwoman and I were here, there was an element in that bill, I believe it is a bill today, to set aside sequestration because I give the chairwoman, I give Chairman uh, Freelingheisen, a uh, ranking uh, member, uh, vote. Listen, we're not fooling anybody with OCO. We're breaking the cap. And the negotiations that are taking place, unfortunately, at a glacial pace, would be for another two-year deal to set aside the Budget Control Act. We are adults. <laughs> the members I deal with are intelligent people. They're good-hearted people. And that after three times, three different Congresses realized that a mistake was made 
not to just come to an agreement is that you have to set that law aside, come to a reasonable bipartisan agreement, and let us proceed. Because if we come to an agreement for two years, 18 months from now, we are all going to be sitting here having the same discussion again because the caps are going to be back in place. How many times do we have to smack our head with a hammer as intelligent people and keep doing it? This is the fifth CR, 129 days, and how is the Institute of Museum and Library Science supposed to plan their work for this year, let alone the Department of Defense? I'm sorry for going on. Just, I hate wasting your time. By being here, this should be solved. And Congress has voted repeatedly to change this, and we won't take it. Well, I, it, there's very little that my friend says I would disagree with. Uh, in, in that remark, and he's exactly right. He's been consistent on this point throughout. Uh, would just point this, uh, that the Budget Control Act, I think, originally had a super committee that we were all assured would deal with entitlement spending, and this would, if, because this penalty was so horrible, it would make them deal with it. Well, this penalty was horrible, and we've been living under it. The super committee didn't, and, uh, you know, that's... Uh, that, it, that means we missed the point, which was you got to deal with entitlement issues at some point, and that's been a bipartisan failure. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody, I, Mr. Delaney and I have a bill actually that deals with Social Security that's very bipartisan. I wish people would look at it, and we need to approach it that way because we're not going to get rid of Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, nor should we. But they've got to be reformed. That's where the money's at. But it did. That's, as you know, what led us here. I will say this: uh, I do think we will get to a deal. Uh, but my friend's right. There needs to be, let's get this two years taken care of, and then, but let's, in the interim, come to, to grips with these other kinds of problems. He's exactly right, and he's been willing to come to the table in good faith. The one glimmer of hope I see here, I know that uh, the chairman and you and I have sat in defense uh, subcommittee appropriations meetings uh, endlessly and talked about sequester and caps and whatever. Well, and I didn't hear much of many other people outside of Hask may be talking about them. Now I hear the whole Congress talking about them, not just at the last minute, but it's, it's now elevating up. So perhaps my friend's persistence in pointing out, uh, and I think he's right, the failures of this particular approach uh, are beginning to have some impact. So, uh, And Mr. Colby, I want to do entitlements because as an appropriator, there will be no money left in a few years to invest in jobs and the economy if we don't. I we know. may, you and I, any two of us, start at different points, but that's two-thirds of the budget. Well, we're, we're appropriators. We always start at different points and get to the same point in the end as a rule. We're pretty good at that. So, I, And I know my friend is quite sincere in that. we got to convince the United States Senate, and we've got to convince the administration, the last one, didn't do it, this one has not got a lot of appetite to do it either. So, but I think the numbers are the numbers, and they drive you to the point that you either sit down and deal with where the money's at, and that's where 60 to 70 percent of all our expenditures in three programs, uh, or you keep doing these things, which is absolutely undermining the defense of the United States, absolutely putting men and women in uniform uh, in a difficult place, and absolutely making it possible for the executive branch, whether it's Democrat or Republican, because our friends in the last administration suffered, uh, you know, it, you can't run the business of America this way. Uh, and uh, the Congress has fallen in the habit, and I think our subcommittee has not. Uh, I think our general committee has not. Uh, and I'm hopeful uh, Congress and the administration are learning a hard lesson to come around. But uh, I appreciate my friend making this point, because he always makes it eloquently, and I find myself almost always in agreement. So. That I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back. Tom, thank you very much. A woman from Rochester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, we, we talk a lot about bipartisanship. I remember when we had it. Uh, and I also remember where sequestration come, came from, and I'm sure you too as well. Uh, we, we know we need to do something about it, but we're not going to. As a matter of fact, if you look at the product of this whole Congress and you were to accuse the things that we passed here as being bipartisan, I assure you there would not be enough evidence to convict it. Uh, we, we've had nothing to do with that tax bill, and I'm glad for that. Uh, but I, once again, uh, I, I say what I said at the beginning. I think this country is at a tipping point. 
I think we're at a very dangerous spot. The third day, the stock market's all over the place. Uh, we, uh, we really have left the rest of the world to wonder, can this great superpower keep its lights on, or what is going to happen here? I think that we've lost some things already that we will never reclaim, but then I'm Scotch, and we're supposed to be depressing. Uh, if we were not, if we were happy people, we wouldn't eat haggis. So give me a few points on that. But I, I just have to say again, what I'd said earlier, we know what we're doing here. We all know it. And the fact is, it just if the, anybody needs any proof of it, look at the darn battle of the memo. The Democrats couldn't even release one. I mean, it's that bad, and the country knows it. I mean, we're not fooling anybody. But I don't want to come back up here again and talk about one of these days we might be part, bipartisan one more time. Uh, I think we better get at it right away. We don't have a lot of time left. Uh, we've got a lot of reclaiming of the reputation of the United States uh, to be about. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I know. Uh, uh, but uh, frankly, I feel better about the whole thing now that i got it off my mind. Thank you all. For Gentleman yields back her time. Thank you very much. The uh, gentleman from Sunnyside, Washington. The gentleman does not seek time. By the way, that's uh, one of your uh, friends and neighbors over there, an appropriator. He's doing a great job for us up here. We cheated and got two of them off your committee. And uh, every time the chairman, Freelyhausen, comes up, he counts on these two gentlemen to make sure that they not only talk about the substance of the performance, but really the facts of the case behind that. We're delighted to have not only Mr. Newhouse, but Chairman Cole with us. Uh, thank you very much. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and look, um, I think we all know what has to be done here. Um, we need a bipartisan deal on the budget caps and many other important issues, quite frankly. And uh, frankly, what we're doing here is a waste of time. We all know what's gonna, what, the, what, the, what this theater will produce over in the Senate. Um, uh, this will, we're here with a, with a fifth CR, which really is cringeworthy. Um, and I think it represents uh, incompetence, quite frankly. My colleague from Texas, Mr. Burgess, says, well, it's, we, we gotta blame the Senate for their 60 vote rule. Well, I think what he's trying to say is that if they didn't have the 60 vote rule, he could t marginalize Democrats entirely and not have to listen to us at all. Um, I think we have enough authoritarianism in this House and in this White House. Um, what we need is, a, is, is bipartisanship where people come together and actually work out uh, some of these issues. Um, we need the Republican leadership. Um, once the Republican leadership in the House and the Senate uh, decide to make a deal, uh, and there are reports that that may be happening, but once they decide that, we can get our work done and stop causing our government to, to just uh, limp along. And um, I, too, would like to see our defense budget, uh, our military budget, uh, funded for more than just short, short periods of time. I want the other budgets to, uh, to be uh, funded uh, uh, for a year, year or two as well. But I just want to put in the record, because um, as somebody, and I'll, with respect to my two colleagues, Mr. Voskoski and Ms. Granger, I'm, I'm somebody who believes that, um, uh, that the defense budget is too big. Um, I'm willing to go along <laughs> if we can get a deal on these other things. Uh, but one of the things that bothers me is that we treat the defense budget, um, when it comes to fraud, waste, and abuse, very differently than we treat other budgets. I'm referring to an article that was appeared in Politico yesterday, I don't know how many of you have seen it, uh, by Brian Bender. It says, massive Pentagon agency lost track of hundreds of millions of dollars. A damning outside review uh, finds that the Defense Logistics Agency has lost track of where it spent the money. It's like, you know, I mean, hundreds of billions of, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, no one knows where it's from. And yet, you know, if this were SNAP or if this were an anti-poverty program, my colleagues would be screaming for the elimination of the agency. Um, I'm simply saying is that when it comes to wasting taxpayers' money, it is wrong whether it's in a domestic agency and it is wrong whether it's in the Pentagon. And it seems to me that there needs to be stronger oversight, uh, uh, I think, you know, of, of some of the practices uh, over in the Pentagon. But having said all of that, again, we need to come together in a bipartisan way and work out a deal on the, on the caps. Once we do that, we don't have to meet like this anymore. And hopefully, if news reports are correct, that may be germinating, uh, and it may happen sooner rather than later. It can't, help, can't happen too soon for me. 
So I thank you all for being here, and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Thank you very much. The gentleman from uh, Windsor Freedom, Colorado. The gentleman does not seek time. The gentleman from Florida. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Visklowski, when we were in this position just a few weeks ago, Democrats uh, have been completely shut out of the process. Were you included in negotiations this time around, and have you been included in negotiations in any of the five continuing resolutions utilized in the past uh, a few months? Now, let me uh, make a point that I recognize that you and Chair Lady Granger uh, get along famously and have worked uh, actively together. But the question that I put is, have you been involved in the process? Uh, I have been uh, completely involved in the negotiations relative to the defense appropriation portion uh, of the five continuing resolutions. As to the negotiations relative to the other 11 subcommittees that also contain defense functions within themselves, absolutely not. Okay. The, it, it occurs to me uh, that come March 23rd, uh, something that we aren't talking about uh, very much, but I'm sure that we will, looming out here um, in the atmosphere of politics is the debt ceiling. And it can only, in my judgment, just get more complicated. Um, and uh, uh, that allows uh, that we're putting politics ahead of our responsibilities. And I just make that as an observation. I don't have any questions. I admire you all for uh, your uh, continuing efforts uh, in all of the, uh, the committees, as well as uh, our committee, uh, but at some point um, uh, we have to um, uh, get busy uh, recognizing that we are failing people here uh, by uh, this process. And I hear it. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, I went to three different functions this past weekend. And the question, uh, interestingly enough, of the continuing resolution was raised at all, all of them. And they were very diverse, an 80-year-old retirement, a funeral, and a Democratic <laughs> Party function. And all three people came up to me asking, what are you all going to do? And uh, I'm sure each of you uh, have your constituents. So I'll present you with that as well. But like Mr. McGovern uh, said, uh, something seems to be percolating out there, and hopefully it will be beneficial for uh, all of us, and we can put some of this uh, to rest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. Thank you very much. This gentleman from Colorado seek time. Uh, no, I have to amendments. Gentleman does not seek time, but does have amendments that he'd like to talk about. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from Wyoming. Gentleman from Wyoming does not seek time. I'll gather my time then. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, you spoke uh, directly to the opioid issue. In aggregate for the year, how much was to be appropriated? Because we did all 12 spending bills. Uh, Chairman, I, um, <clears throat> I don't have that figure in front of me. I will say from my... Um, uh, you're probably aware some of the communities that I represent in my district have been as hard hit by this as epidemic as any other in the country. Um, they are reaching out for help. Um, I think there's more we can do, more that we should do. Um, and but you don't know how much we did that you're voting against, that you don't want to be there for the whole year is my point. And Chairman, I, I would point to the fact that President Trump has made uh, this a, uh, declared a, a national emergency for an yes, opioid epidemic. Um, that has not come with an additional request for funding. We put together a, a, a panel. Uh, yes, sir. Put, but in fairness, yes, uh, we appropriated money we did. because we did all 12 spending bills. Mm -hmm. And my only point is you don't know how much we appropriated to know whether that's a good amount or a bad amount. You simply want more. And all I'm suggesting to you is 
if we really want to help us, let's do the whole year. Let's get that done. Mm -hmm. And then you'll find out evidently then whether that was enough or, or not. But I, I really would, would argue with all of my colleagues, if we'll release what's out there in normally in the budget, it will then go and be used for a year for the government to properly use what they've been given. But what we're doing is saying it wasn't enough, not even knowing how much it was, and then putting them on a month by month a time frame. And, and you just can't lose weight that way. You got to be able to lose weight because you plan on what you're gonna do, and, or if you're gonna spend money and run a government, give them the whole thing. And I just, uh, it's the one part in, in me that is the uh, balance back to my colleagues that say it's not enough, but we really weren't sure how much, and we're really gonna hold it up another month rather than doing what we said we were gonna do. And Chairman, if I may, um, you are right that I don't have that, that number at my fingertips. I would point out um, that this has been a, uh, a national crisis now for multiple years, that we are operating under a fifth version of a CR, that if we were serious about making the investments that even the president has spoken to, that he put together a, a, a top-notch commission led by Governor Christie that came up with a number of recommendations, including funding, that have not been put forth, that have not been acted on, that if we were serious about actually doing this, then we wouldn't have gone through a, a health care bill that cut $800 billion out of Medicaid, which is the largest addiction payer of addiction services in this country. That was put forth by this committee on multiple, uh, by the Congress on multiple occasions. We would not be having a debate about whether we should continue to actually make some of these investments. And if we cared an awful lot about it, we would be willing to engage with our Democratic colleagues on some of the issues that we also believe passionately in in order to move the ball forward. We still have not seen that. And so you're right to point out that, unfortunately, on short notice, I don't have that exact figure in front of me. I would also counter with, if that were a priority of this House and of this Congress and of this administration, more than giving lip service to it through a commission that is not funded and is not acted on, we would actually see some priorities behind it. And again, not another $800 billion cut from Medicaid, as was put forth multiple times, and then a discussion around entitlement reform after passing a $1.5 trillion tax cut onto corporations and predominantly the wealthy. So uh, I hear your, your point on it. You are right to make it. I think there's unfortunately some pushback on it that I think is legitimate, and I would love to have the opportunity, although I do not sit, obviously, on uh, the Appropriations Committee, to engage with anybody here about a, through a process and a discussion about what, could be, what, what steps could be taken to ensure that all of us, and, and this has been something that Look, Chairman Rogers, uh, former Chairman Rogers of the Appropriations Committee, one of the first meetings I had when I came to Congress was with him, given the, the, how deeply he cares about this issue and how much his district has been affected by it. Um, this is not a partisan issue, clearly. Um, it is a shame that it gets held up in partisan gamesmanship around it, because I don't think anybody, we're not fooling anybody about it. In fairness, back to your answer, I would say that sure. in the... Uh, in the bills that have been passed previously, the administration has been tasked with doing exactly what you talked about. We went to them and said, please tell us how we should properly spend money. Tell us where the problem is. And that has been given to them. I've spoken 15 times to the lead health officer for HHS, Dr. Vanila Singh. Dr. Singh is the chief medical officer and is personally responsible for legislation that I assume you voted on, but that was last year where she is attempting to give direction back to Congress as she was required to do. And it's my understanding that as we began this effort last year, remember this is last October that we should have funded this. It, it is. That 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 was the beginning of the new administration, and we said to the new administration, go figure out this opioid thing. And we put in law and passed it, and yet we're now putting them on a literally 30-day schedule where they can't even, I'm not making excuses for them, but they cannot properly gather the team together from across the country because they've not been funded properly. So my point is, I think you're expecting something that you just want to spend money without a plan. 
And so I would love to work with you. I'd like for you to meet Dr. Singh. I'd like for her to be a part of your regular lexicon. We've had you up when we talked about NIH, I believe at least one time. Yes, Dr. Singh was one of those people that stood up months ago and said, not knowing we were gonna do this three or four or five times, I'm responsible for this, I'm gonna produce this product, but we don't fund her. So she can't get it done. So I'm not picking on you, Joe. No, I I'd love to that, have Chairman. you be a part of it so that we know how much was there to where you know how much should have been there or how much more you need, but we need to plan. Mr. Chairman. Dr. Burgess will correct me, but in, in the 21st Century <laughs> Cures Act, we put it was in there. The yeah, 21st. We, we put mandatory spending of a, of a billion dollars over a two-year period, so that'd be half a billion this year. And the CARA Act, we authorized an appropriate, I believe, 180 million. So that would put this year's spending at around 600 million dollars. Now, Dr. Burgess knows it better than I, but I, I, I believe I'm in the ballpark. Will you yield? I would yield to the gentleman. We're, we're trying to help us all out here, and I know the gentleman, Mr. Kennedy, agrees with that. Well, I just wanted to articulate that the subcommittee and the full committee has been active on this issue. We had a uh, opiate day in the committee last October where we allowed any member, not just of the subcommittee, full committee, any member of Congress to come in and tell us about the problems they might be having in their districts and to share with us any ideas they might have for solutions to the problem. And we did receive a number of those suggestions and we are working, th working through those and developing legislative products and that is being done in a bipartisan fashion. Um, and of course, as the gentleman from Massachusetts knows well, we had a hearing not in the health subcommittee, but in the oversight subcommittee, money's not always the answer. We have people who were recycling through sober homes, and I think we had the district attorney from your area who talked to us about the problems that he was having with people leaving his jurisdiction, going down to another place, and ending up recycling through so many times they didn't survive. Um, so I certainly don't want to fund that activity more. I'm interested in knowing what we can do that is that is helpful, but I certainly don't want to do things that are that are adding further injury. And then I will just add, because the committee has had some difficulty getting information from the Drug Enforcement Administration, and we are at a point now where perhaps that information is finally going to be delivered, but it has been a, a you cannot solve this problem with money if you don't figure out why one little pharmacy in West Virginia got nine million pills to dispense in a town the population of, uh, of just a few thousand people. So those are all things that are ongoing right now. Yeah, money is part of the, part of the equation, but there are other things, and that's, of course, what the authorizing committee is, is, is working on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse, excuse just a moment. Did the gentleman yeah, I, wish I do. to? I, do, I, just, I, will, I will engage the Thank gentleman now. I, I just want to say that in Massachusetts and in states all across this country, at a local level, people are finding innovative ways and effective ways to deal with this crisis. And if you're telling me that we're doing enough or that we have funded this enough, then I will gladly bring you to my district. And gentleman, show you yield. Th if, if, just one second. If, if, to show you I know I control the time, but right. I also yielded him for the right. time to discuss right. with me. The gentleman doesn't even know how much we're spending. Well, I'm, I'm telling you right now that it, whatever it is we're spending, it's not getting to a lot of the communities that need it, number but one. But let me say this two, to if you, if you to If you want to have a year-long spending bill, you should do what I suggested. Republican leaders sit down with their Democratic counterparts and negotiate a budget for more than a couple of weeks at a time. Uh, but I'm telling you, the, what has been done up to this point uh, is, is, is not reaching its way down to the community level, at least in my communities, uh, where they desperately need funds, um, and they're being told, no, we don't have any money, we don't have any That's money. That's right, and reclaiming my time, and that was my point to Mr. Kennedy, because we only give them one month at a time. If you would, but sir, sir, well, all you gotta do is vote yes. So, so that my point is, we don't even know how much, but it's not enough, but we're putting you on a every other month uh, diet here, and then you say they don't have enough. Why don't we look at what we're supposed to do? Hold sir, on, Chairman. Just, oh, sorry. So I'm just, Mr. Levin, did you wish to engage me? 
Just briefly. Yes, sir. Mr. Roskam is having a hearing, and I'll be there on this very subject. And I was going to meet somebody 15 minutes ago to prepare for the hearing on this very subject. Good. Thank you. And, so, and so if you'll excuse me. Uh, in also, fact, I will. But I think we'll report back to you. I just want to say, you say we don't know how much money, and we say it isn't enough. The problem is, if you go to communities in any state, surely in Michigan, the impact of what we've appropriated so far has really not worked. Well, that's why we asked HHS to give us an idea under the Cures Bill. Mr. Kennedy, okay, thank you. I know everybody's got to get out of here. I'm the last to ask questions, and I put myself in that position. Does the gentleman wish to engage? Chairman, yes. The gentleman's recognized. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, I appreciate your pushback, um, and I would point out um, two things. First, um, I'd love to obviously engage with Ms. Uh, Dr. Singh, uh, if I remember her name correctly. Um, I would be curious if she believed that the proper way to go forward in dealing with uh, a opioid uh, epidemic in this country was going to be an $800 billion cut to Medicaid and the eradication of essential health benefits program. Well, I don't, think that's, I don't think that's a question. I think what she's been tasked to do is tell us about the opioid crisis, where it works, how should we be treating veterans, how do we look at their 21 deaths a day, how do we look at the other people Ag who are dying? Ag agreed, sir, and cl critically, uh, of course, uh, the 21 deaths a day out of our veterans community is uh, a national tragedy and needs and deserves our attention. There's over 30 people that die a day from opioids. Um, so we, if the discussion is, are we doing enough, the answer is no. I would wholeheartedly agree with, with Dr. Burgess, Chairman Burgess, um, about the fact that the solutions to this are not just more money. I would challenge this committee and any other member of Congress to say that you are going to solve this problem by reconfiguring some of the regulatory uh, atmosphere around this alone and not appropriating more dollars to it. I would also charge th this committee with uh, an understanding that yes, CR by CR isn't gonna get us there and I agree that yes, we need to solve part of this program if we cared about it enough, Chairman, then there should be a way to engage Democrats on the other reservations that we have. The idea to say that, because I don't happen to have, uh, because I was here on short notice and I don't have to happen to have that number at my fingertips, that somehow this is not something that Democrats or Republicans care about or as a priority, I, I don't think is true. I do think that there's a, a necessity at this point to say, if we want to govern the country in a way that is going to, that I think constituents who I represent expect, then it's not so much to ask that those voices be heard, and they're not shut out because they are represented by a Democrat. And I will tell you with a heavy heart that that is the, the, the feeling that an awful lot of folks around this country have because of the way in which this process has been engaged and some of the choices that have been made. Um, and so we continue CR by CR. We will see what the Senate ends up doing. Maybe they get to a cap steal. Maybe that comes back. We will evaluate that, that program as it comes. But um, to blame this entirely on process without uh, taking some responsibility for the people that run that process, I think, is um, not a wholly honest assessment of the circumstance. Fine. I simply engaged you on the one issue you brought up. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, lady. And gentlemen, thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. I know everybody's busy today. I want to thank you for your time. Please remember we have an Austin stenographer who would appreciate receiving anything you brought in writing, which will enable her to accurately uh, finish off the record. And I know Mr. Kennedy will comply with that request if he brought anything in writing. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. We will uh, allow the committee to... Uh, allow its guest to, to leave at this time for a second. The uh, gentleman, Mr. Polis, would be invited to uh, appear before the committee as a witness.
Mr. Polis, we're delighted that you've uh, come before the committee with your ideas. And uh, pending uh, them closing that door, I will be recognizing you. Uh, Ms. Booth, the clerk, is going to close that door for us. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three uh, very important amendments to this uh, spending bill that uh, is a must-pass bill because the government will shut down this Friday. Um, but these are three that I ask for the House to simply be allowed to vote on. Uh, I am confident that they would pass if, if members of this body, Republicans and Democrats, have the opportunity. The First Amendment is the Bipartisan Dream Act, uh, introduced by Representative Roybal Allard. I offer it as an amendment. It's a bipartisan piece of legislation supported by many Democrats and many Republicans in this body. Uh, I know on this very committee we've talked about uh, whether people were working on this issue. Uh, I did, along with the chairman, have faith that people were. But what I would remind the chair is that the time is, is running out. And I think it's, it's time that the House simply be allowed to vote on the DREAM Act uh, and send it along to the Senate, where I'm confident it would also muster 60 votes. Um, this critical legislation, as you know, would allow uh, people who have deferred action, dreamers, to receive permanent residency and someday be able to earn their citizenship. Uh, after President Trump, Trump created the crisis by announcing that he was ending the DACA program in early March, just a few weeks away, uh, Democrats and Republicans came together in support of finding a way uh, for the over one million aspiring Americans here to be able to have a pathway to citizenship. I'm proud to say the DREAM Act that I'm offering as an amendment provides that way. Uh, this bill has significant support from Democrats, Republicans, the business community, uh, people in the states. It would allow uh, people who are dreamers to finally know that they're no longer in danger of deportation to a country they don't even know, that they might not have even been in since they're one or three, where they might not even speak a language. Uh, Americans of all stripes, all parties, all ideologies agree that dreamers uh, should be protected and finally be able to take their ranks among other Americans. Uh, this is an urgent issue, um, Mr. Speaker. My guest for the State of the Union last week was a dreamer, uh, Anna Relly, who, like so many others, uh, faces the potential for deportation and to no longer be able to work legally in just a few weeks if we don't pass this bill. She graduated Adams City High School with a 4.3 GPA. She's a triple major at Colorado State University in my district. Uh, I'm offering this for people like Javier in Summit County. Uh, Javier is the father of an American child, a wonderful daughter. And because of his status as a recipient of deferred action, he's had to become active and political. Many people would rather be able to just work and support their families and live their lives. But I'm proud that Javier stepped up and organized a march for Dreamers in Summit County last week and had hundreds of Summit County residents joining him uh, in saying, let's urge Congress to act. I'm doing this for aspiring dreamers like Marcos, one of the most promising young up and coming Latino leaders in our state of Colorado, but somebody who's being held back by, again, lack of definitively knowing what his status is or whether he'll be able even to work legally in just a few weeks. Mr. Chairman, I ask that this amendment be included for the continuing resolution. Our committee here, the Rules Committee, can simply allow an up or down vote on this amendment on the House floor. I'm confident that it will get a majority of votes. Many Republicans, probably every Democrat, will support this and finally advance a solution to President Trump so that he can provide a pathway to citizenship for our dreamers. We need to guarantee that the over a million aspiring Americans that are already here, that know no other country, will simply have the chance to live and work in the, in, and make their contributions count and be accepted in the only country we know. I ask the committee make my DREAM Act amendment in order. I further ask that we make my amendment in order with regard to uh, protections for states that, inter that uh, are worried about the Department of Justice interfering with our state marijuana laws. Uh, I brought this up before on this committee, and this committee has thus far failed to act, and the situation is becoming urgent uh, in the face of the revocation of the Cole Memo, which provided some guidance to the state uh, attorneys that they were to not prosecute uh, against uh, marijuana-related business or personal activities that were legal under state law, like they are in my home state of Colorado. And I would point out that some form of medicinal or 
uh, recreational or therapeutic marijuana, CBDs, or other activities is legal in over 40 states at this point. And an increasing number of states choose to regulate uh, marijuana like alcohol, as my home state of Colorado has done. In fact, 95% of the population of our country lives in an area that has some form of legalized cannabis. To be clear, this, uh, like the DREAM Act, is not a partisan issue at all. Uh, this is, amendment is based on the bipartisan language of the McClintock-Polis Amendment. Uh, we have about 70 members, including 20 Republicans, who signed a, leader, a letter asking that this amendment be included in the CR. So Democrats and Republicans have asked that this be included. I think it will pass if we simply allow a vote on this. Uh, and Mr. Chair, I know it's an issue that you feel passionately about, and I want to be clear, you certainly don't have to support, nor does anybody support, nobody has to support marijuana legalization in order to support this amendment. Uh, nobody has to support legalization to have an up or down vote on this amendment. There is, of course, far-reaching support of the idea that some issues like marijuana policies are better addressed at state level, and that's all this amendment would do, is say whether you believe it should be legal or not, it should be better addressed at the state level. And by the way, according to an April 2017 poll, 71% of Americans agree that this basic concept, that the government should not enforce federal marijuana laws in states that allow its use. A majority of Republicans, a majority of Democrats, and a strong majority of independents. Um, the list of reasons that one should support this amendment getting a chance for a vote goes on and on. But simply put, uh, Colorado has chosen to give money to classrooms, not cartels, create jobs, not addicts and boost our economy, not our prison population. I would further indicate that states that have uh, medicinal or recreational marijuana have a 25% lower opioid abuse rates than states that continue to criminalize the use of marijuana. Uh, but regardless of the chair or any other member's feelings on whether the federal government should legalize or not marijuana, let's at least agree that we should not engage in federal enforcement actions uh, in states that have chosen to go a different route. Finally, Mr. Chair, I'm offering an amendment that would simply make a 1% cut to the defense expenditures under this bill. I would add the bloated defense expenditures under this bill. This bill spends significantly more on the military than even President Trump has requested. And with my 1% cut, it would still be well, well above prior year levels, and it would still be well above President Trump's request. In a time when the government is being asked to do more with less, it's time we ask the Department of Defense to seek opportunities for strategic cuts that keep our military strong and save taxpayer money. Now, my amendment would only go a small way to uh, protecting the fiscal security of our nation. It is vital to national security. When we spend beyond our means on our military, we make our nation less secure rather than more secure by making ourselves economically beholden to foreign powers like China and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I believe that the spending levels of this bill, as currently structured, well above President Trump's own request, are fiscally irresponsible. This, this base funding bill exceeds the Budget Control Act by a considerable amount, and that's without including the billions of spending that's been inappropriately placed in what we call the contingency account as a way to deliberately undermine the agreed upon budget caps that were designed to control our deficit. Let me be clear, if this bill is passed, our budget deficit will increase substantially, Mr. Chairman. And my amendment, which I would love to be able to work uh, with the Republicans and Democrats on the floor of the House to pass, would, would make a modest decrease to our federal deficit. I should remind everybody that again, even with a 1% sensible reduction, this spending bill would leave us well above the original defense caps from the Budget Control Act, well above the money that the generals and President Trump have requested for the military. I don't believe that passing a partisan defense appropriations bill digging our nation deeper and deeper in debt is the best use of Congress's time. We have another government funding deadline looming, and I hope that we can allow an open discussion and a vote on this amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope that uh, in the spirit of bipartisanship, we can allow under this rule uh, several hours of debate with regard to the DREAM Amendment, with regard to the McClintock-Polis Amendment, and finally with regard to a 1% cut for our military expenditures, and I'd be happy to yield for any questions. Thank you very much. I'll give the first question. The gentleman, Mr. Viscoska, said that he was completely involved, that the, uh, that the Defense Appropriations Bill was completely bipartisan, and that he was engaged in every single part of it. You refer to it as a partisan bill. 
There are, uh, you know, defense hawks and fiscal hawks on both sides of the aisle, as you know, Mr. Chairman. During my time here as a co-sponsor of the balanced budget amendment, as somebody who's consistently tried to find savings on both the military and non-military side of the budget, my position has been clear, as have some of my Republican colleagues uh, who have been clear that they value fiscal responsibility over additional expenditures for the military above and beyond what's required. My point is it, it was you're the leading person for the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives completely supported it, and I don't think he would refer to it as being partisan. I believe he would in the context of not addressing the non-defense caps. Oh, but we're talking about the military. Well, again, um, I believe that Democrats to a person would say uh, there are some, again, Mr. Chairman, there are some Democrats that are hawkish and value military spending over fiscal stability, and there are some Republicans that have that value as well. Uh, and but those Democrats that do, and I'm, I'm not here to represent them, but having spoken with them and know them, uh, they seek those funding levels only if we can address the non-military side of the budget and prevent cuts to education and health care and issues that, as Democrats, they also care about. My, my point might be, Mr. Polis, I'm not trying to argue with you at all. You refer to it as a partisan Please. bill. We try and refer to the, de the defense bill as a bipartisan bill. And when Republicans make any accusation, as we have seen in the media, about somebody not participating or being un-whatever they might be. I want us to be together on this. So I, I err on the side of saying it was the partisan bill. Pete was very much engaged, supported every bit of it, and I considered that uh, Mrs. Pelosi's representative to that. So. I think it'd be bad for me to refer to it in, in a negative way or that anybody that didn't support it as not being... Uh, well, again, to be clear... We disagree. Yeah, yeah but in the, in the context of not including the non-defense spending levels, it is partisan, to be clear, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And I think well, Mr. We're talking Kukoski about just the military. Well. Just the military piece is all... Well, the fact that today. this bill only funds the military and doesn't fund the rest of government for more than a few weeks, that itself is a partisan concept. Okay. So if we had put in there, see, last week we heard we're not going to vote for it because it didn't include the military for a year out of the Senate and other people on this side. Now we're hearing uh, include the rest of the government. So, Well, I'll let other members speak for themselves. But, uh, again, the partisan aspect is seeking these huge increases in military funding without coming to agreement or funding for health care and education. Yes, sir. Chairman Colton. No questions. No questions. No que Does your side have any questions for the gentleman from Colorado? Sir? Does any other member of the committee? The gentleman from Windsor, Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and just very briefly, um, on the Dreamer amendment that you mm -hmm. have, Mr. Polis, um, I believe that the president has said that he is in favor of this, uh, uh, maybe not in this exact form, but, yeah. but this concept. Uh, if and when we have uh, funding for border security, uh, we end chain migration and we end the visa lottery system as they exist now. Do you have any objection to uh, border security funding? You know, uh, I was surprised that not a single Republican offered an amendment to this bill to fund any border security. But uh, it obviously wouldn't fall to me to do that as somebody that is certainly willing to have that discussion, but not as somebody who believes that it's a, a good use of taxpayer resources. But okay. if a Republican has an idea to, to add border security, they should offer an amendment to this funding bill. This is the vehicle to do that. Uh, I'm not sure you answered my question. I asked you, did you have an objection to border uh, enhanced border security? Many of the bipartisan agreements that, that potentially would be discussed uh, have a component of border security. And again, I was surprised that not a single Republican offered any border security funding under this funding bill. Are you in favor of funding, more funding for border security? I think there's necessary improvements to border security that Republicans and Democrats can agree upon that would reduce time at the checkpoints, reduce illegal smuggling of both people as well as, as illegal products. And do you have any objection to changing the chain migration system that we currently have? Well, again, you're talking about other issues. That's not a funding issue, uh, with, with due respect. Uh, and If you can reduce funding you know, for marijuana, you can certainly reduce funding for chain migration. Do you have any problem with, with changing this, the system that we currently have? Well, I'm here to testify on the DREAM Act, which I'm offering. If the gentleman from Windsor has 
ideas with regard to family migration, I would encourage him to offer those as amendments and we can debate them, but it's hard without having any proposal in front of me to, uh, to d debate what you're talking about. So are you satisfied that the chain migration system as it exists now should continue? Well, again, my amendment uh, that I'm offering today uh, can't possibly address every issue under the sun. It addresses the DREAM Act. If the gentleman wants to address family unification, the gentleman can certainly offer an amendment as a starting point, and I would be happy to talk about wh whatever that amendment is, but I'm not sure what the gentleman's ideas for, for addressing it are. And, and moving on to visa lottery system, um, uh, the gentleman, again, uh, the president said that it was a necessary part of the package. Um, do you have any suggestions or changes that you would make to the visa lottery system that we have in place now? Uh, again, no Republicans or Democrats have offered amendments to, to modify that. I would add that I am supportive of a bipartisan proposal uh, put out by the Problem Solvers Caucus that does address the areas that were indicated by the President and is based on the language of the Graham-Durbin compromise uh, in the Senate. Uh, so uh, there are responsible parties that I hope are working, but the point of why I think this is critical to allow now, Mr. Chairman, is, is time is simply running out. Uh, and I believe that this is a bipartisan, bipartisan proposal, the DREAM Act, that would address the needs of DREAMers. If other members do want to address other issues, I would encourage them to offer amendments as well. I yield back. Chairman yields back his time. Thank you very much. Mr. Pulse, I want to thank you very much for not only taking time to address these issues that you believe are important, but bringing them before your committee and our committee, and we value your time and thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. If you'll please make sure that whatever you brought in writing, you can please leave for Austin's stenographer. Is there any other member that would seek time to give testimony today to the Senate members of H.R. 1892? Seeing none, this now closes the hearing portion, and uh, before we move to the motion, I'd like to acknowledge that we have several people. One, uh, a fighting Texas A&M intern, Landon Woods, who is in my office this semester. Landon, I want to thank you for taking time to be here with us today. And secondly, I have two, I don't know if they're constituents or not, but they're from Dallas, Texas. Uh, uh, Jana Gardner, who's from Healing Hands Ministry in Dallas, Texas, and Jose Camacho, who's from Texas Community Health Centers, which is responsible for and ask that uh, I make sure that the community health centers would be included in the bill today. And I want to thank both of them for taking time to be during the entire committee hearing today. And I hope that I learned something and hope they did too. And I look forward to engaging them. The chair, now may receive a motion from the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule providing for the consideration of the Senate amendment to H.R. 1892, the Honoring Hometown Heroes Act, Rule makes an order a motion offered by the chair of the Committee on Appropriations or a designee that the House concur in the Senate amendment with an amendment consisting of the text of Rules Committee Print 115-58 modified by the amendment printed in the Rules Committee report. Rule waives all points of order against consideration of the motion. The rule provides that the Senate amendment and the motion shall be considered as read. Finally, the rule provides one hour of debate on the motion equally divided and controlled by the chair and the ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriation. Thank you very much. You've now heard the motion from the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma. Is there a amendment or discussion to that gentleman from Colorado? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule to uh, that the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers for my amendment uh, number three to uh, insert the text of H.R. 3440, the DREAM Act, at the end of Division D. And if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, I testified about this, and this would simply uh, allow the DREAM Act to be part of it. As the gentleman from uh, Windsor indicated, if other members have other ideas that, that they want to look at with regard to changes, I'd encourage them to bring this forward. But there is an imminent crisis for people like Annarelli and Javier and so many others, 18,000 in my home state alone of Colorado, including many in the gentleman uh, from the 4th Congressional District, district as well as mine. So I hope that this com committee will choose to make this amendment in order, and I yield back. Thank you very much. I would respond back. The gentleman is aware that the, uh, the White House has engaged with a number of members uh, on this issue. We know that there was a uh, viewpoint of looking at March and able to get there, and I've been told that the United States Senate intends to bring up their own provisions. Uh, Mr. McConnell had indicated that in the next week or two. 
So there might be an immediate emergency, but we are on some process as we started last September, I believe, where the president announced he'd like to see the Congress do this by March. This is now February the 6th, and I believe we're on target to produce, I hope, if we can get through this government funding issues, an opportunity to turn our attention that way. So I would offer a vote against the amendment. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the vote now be on the post amendment. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 Roll call, please. The gentleman asked for a roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins, no. Mr. Byrne. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Buck. No. Mr. Buck, no. Ms. Cheney. No. Ms. Cheney, no. Ms. Slaughter. No. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Further amendment or discussion seen a gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Chairman, I have amendments to the rule. I move the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers for my amendment number four, which would prevent the Drug Enforcement Agency from interfering with legal and, and uh, well-regulated state laws. And again, Mr. Chairman, this is also an urgent item uh, because of the uh, Attorney General choosing to rescind the Cole memo, leaving grave uncertainty for the tens of thousands of people who work in the legal marijuana industry in my state, the hundreds of thousands of consumers uh, some, many of whom have their medicinal marijuana cards on file with the state. So there's a lot of concern about this. It's urgent. We can address it now. Uh, it's a strong bipartisan support for this amendment, and in fact, over 20 Republicans and many Democrats have called for its in conclusion, inclusion in the continuing resolution, uh, and I hope that we can advance this to the floor. Further discussion? Seeing none, the vote now will be on the post bench. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 No, have it. No, have it. Roll seven. call, please. Gentlemen, ask for roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Collins. No. Mr. Collins, no. Mr. Byrne. Mr. Newhouse. No. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Buck. No. Mr. Buck, no. Ms. Cheney. No. Ms. Cheney, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter. Uh, let me abstain. May I repeat that, Mr. Chairman? Gentlewoman, Ms. Slaughter. Would wish to be marked present. as abstain. Ms. Sla <coughs> Slaughter, present. Mr. McGovern. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Three yeas, eight nays, amendments not one agreed present. To, not agreed to. Thank you very much. Uh, further amendments or discussion? Gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Chairman, I have amendments to the rule. I move the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers for my amendment number two, which would provide a 1% cut to overall defense spending in this bill. Thank you very much. Discussion? I oppose the amendment. I believe we should uh, pass the bill and fund the military for the remaining part of the year. The United States military contains men and women who are volunteers and protect this great nation. I'm proud of the service that my son provides and many others, and I oppose this amendment to further uh, harm the United States military. Further discussion, seeing none, the vote now be on the post amendment. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 Knows have it, knows have it. Uh, roll call, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen, ask for roll call, but clerk will pull the committee. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Cole? No. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Burgess? Mr. Burgess? No. Mr. Collins? No. Mr. Collins? No. Mr. Byrne? Mr. Newhouse? No. Mr. Newhouse? No. Mr. Buck? No. Mr. Buck? No. Ms. Cheney? No. Ms. Cheney? No. Ms. Slaughter? Aye. Ms. Slaughter? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Polis? Aye. Mr. Polis? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman? No. Clerk report. Four yeas, eight nays. Amendment's not agreed to. Uh, further amendment or discussion? Seeing none, the vote will now be on the motion from the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Ayes have it, ayes have it. Have Gentlewoman asks for a roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Collins. Aye. Mr. Collins. Aye. Mr. Byrne. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Buck. Mr. Buck, aye. Ms. Cheney, Ms. Cheney, aye. Ms. Slaughter, no. Ms. Slaughter, no. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis, no. Mr. Polis, no. Mr. Chairman, aye. Mr. Chairman, Clerk report aye. The total. Eight yeas, four nays. The uh, motion is agreed to, is agreed to. Accordingly, I will be handling this for Republicans. And I shall be the Thank you very much. Aye. Judge Hastings, do you yes, have a question? Yes, Mr. Jumps Chairman. Right when will we be back here to do the actual bill? 
Thank you. We do not currently have additional meetings at this time. However, I would uh, ask that everyone stay flexible in the event we're asked to measure or provide any other measures related to government funding. And we talked about this in detail yesterday. So nothing is scheduled at this time, Judge. Let me, may I say? Yes, ma'am. We're pretty disappointed uh, that this is happening right in the middle of our retreat because we're pretty sure we're going to have to stop it and come back on Thursday. Yes, ma'am. Would the, um, would the gentleman engage me on that? Ever. If the gentlewoman engaged me. <laughs> The Republican bill said we would have been another week. It was the Democrats who insisted, I didn't say who, the Democrats in the Senate, the Democrats in the House insisted that it be this date. We did not want this date. We begged against it. We then consented because the Senate passed it. So uh, it had nothing well, to do with the House. Just again, it's a idea of the Louisiana. Well, I, I, the ways I agree with that. And thank you very much. This uh, closes the hearing portion, and we'll uh, now uh, move to the floor. I don't think anybody's going to be on the floor.